All right, good evening and welcome uh, back to your view with me, Unkopote JJ Tawani. We're coming to you live from Linden here in Johannesburg on this rainy Tuesday night. And of course, Musi Maimani, former DA leader as well as a, a, a politician in his own right, joins me tonight for a night of reflections and of course uh, to casting our eyes into the future. It's uh, my great privilege to be here and it's great to see you. And I want to, I don't know if it's still appropriate to say happy 2020. Yeah, happy 2020, my brother. Uh, all the best. Eh? I wish co you all compliments. The best. Compliments. Yeah, compliments. Compliments. And to you, my brother. Thank you for keeping your way. You say, as January comes, you will be here. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I know you are quite busy trying to form a new political party. Because we'll get to, get to that now. A lot of people, <laughs> you, you, you know, you. Uh, my experience of, of, of your leadership in the last uh, three years, right, has been that of uh, never being shy to be out there, both when it is good news and when it's bad news. Yeah. I always say to people, one of the, 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 the things that I appreciated when there was that penny sparrow controversy is that you're one of the few leaders who was able to go to the apartheid museum and actually address the country transparently about the problems that were happening there, mm. right? And I hope that that continues in the future, and that's why I was surprised a bit that as, uh, once you resigned, right, it, you sort of decided to do a blackout to say, hey, can you, you people, can you just all leave me alone a little bit, yeah. right? So there are a lot of people who, in the three years that you were a leader, right, actually joined the DA just because you were there. Let's not mess around about it. You convinced them to say, this is the vehicle, etc. And then Bombshell says, this is not the right vehicle. So I need us to, uh, before we get into the future plans and so on, just Sure. Quick reflections, sure. two or three big themes. Why did you jump ship? No, well, thank you. And, and I, I, I want to say that in leading the DA, I had the great privilege of serving mm. South Africans in that. Mm. I always held the vision of building this South Africa that is non-racial. Always held the vision that I believe that we needed to move away from mm. Cape Town and be based in Johannesburg. Mm. I always felt it was going to be important that we govern in more places than just simply governing the, Johannesburg the or, well, or Cape Town, yeah. that we needed to do Joburg, um, Tuane, Nelson Mandela Bay. Yeah. And it was through that that I think you realized the organization was growing and added new complexity. Mm. But it required the fortitude to say, how do we keep going through that? And it wasn't always going to be a straight road. Mm -hmm. So for me, some of the big lessons that we take on board is that um, sometimes when you as the leader are committed to something, it doesn't mean everybody is always committed to that. Mm. Your job is to always keep sharing and envisioning. Yeah. Be clear about your convictions. The task of building a non-racial South Africa upon which all citizens can live together is never an easy one. And therefore you must be conscious of the fact that there will be some people who don't necessarily support that one South Africa for all vision. Mm. And ultimately, you, for me, uh, it gave me time to reflect on my own style, my own personality, and be able to say, you know what, just because sometimes when you look at the electoral scoreboard, that the vision isn't right. The struggle for non-racialism has been waged over decades. Sometimes it's in progress, sometimes it's in setbacks, but we have to keep going. So I certainly am, um, have, have had some time to close that door, yes. say to myself, uh, I, served my, I served the time there, and now it's important that I focus on a new journey and build a vehicle that upholds uh, some of the values that I, yeah. in fact, the values that I hold, and actually disturb politics in South Africa. Yeah. A, a lot of people, though, will still be hung or always have a hangover a bit, because three years is quite a solid time, right, where you, you, you build mm. up expectations, you make promises of a new, a new way, right? You, you convince people who, when, who had given up on politics, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Let's take a look at what you said when you actually resigned, hmm. uh, just to trigger the memory there briefly before we continue that conversation. The year has always been but a vehicle to pursue and further the vision. I'm still committed to this vision. To inspire hope amongst the millions of South Africans. To seek justice for the wrongs of the past. To restore dignity to the millions. To heal our nation. 
to break down the barriers of entry into our economy, and to create work and meaningful opportunity, especially for young people, and ultimately to remove the ANC out of government. This is always in pursuit of that dream of building one united, prosperous, and reconciled South Africa for all. There does come a time when leaders must step back from all noise and conjecture and make a sober and honest assessment as to what the future indeed does hold. And I've spent the last few days doing exactly that alongside with my wife. And in the end, we've come to the conclusion that despite my best efforts, perhaps the DIA is not the best vehicle which is suited to take forward the vision of building one South Africa for all. And therefore, it is with great sadness that in order to continue this fight for the vision I strongly believe and the country I so dearly love, I will today step down as leader of the DIA. I'll continue my role as parliamentary leader if the party makes that decision until the end of the year. After which I strongly believe the party must in fact go to Congress in order to elect new leadership. Right. What, when was your Damascus? Just talk frankly to me about it because remember you had just led a massive a, a electoral campaign, you, it was a big fight, right? Yeah. Um, uh, to, 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 on that result, that really, if you look at the overall results in the country, I, I believe it resulted in a status quo, really. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of DA being number two, EFF number three, ANC number one, honest, with a little bit of growth of this EFF, a little bit of decline for by you and the ANC, right? So it, it means that you, 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 you you had to psych yourself to convince people to vote for the D. One was your Damascus. Why the result of Damascus that says this is no longer the vehicle? Was Helen Zilles returned the Damascus? Was Mashaba's resignation the Damascus? There must be a Damascus moment. And I uh, wanted to share that with us. Well, there's been, uh, you know, when you take such a big decision, it's a, it's a big decision. I had invested mm. so much of my life to this particular project. <coughs> mm. I think it became to me I remember once, because any leader, you know, sometimes you look at by-election results. Yeah. And I remember the one Wednesday I was looking at some by-election results, mm. and it became quite clear that in certain communities, there were particular South Africans who had committed to saying, we're going to move towards the Freedom Front Plus because that's what we were. Mm. And I could feel internally within the organization there was this inbuilt pressure to say, your job must be too solely to go back and get back those Freedom Front Plus voters. Mm. Now, I believe all citizens have the right to choose mm. which political party they want to be a part of. But at the same time as all of that, I also believe that it is important that citizens who want to sit in the middle, who say want to build a diverse organization, want to work together, yeah must also be given the space and the permission to do so. Yeah. When you push the pressure to say your sole duty is to go pursue this, I thought, but that's, that's not at the end of the day what I want to give my life towards. Yeah. Not because I have a hatred of a particular race or a particular group of yeah. people, but fundamentally because I do think there comes a point where you say to yourself, that's a choice citizens have made. Let us continue to build with South Africans who want to occupy this space. Yeah. of black people, white people working together, yeah. who understand the purpose of redress. Yeah. Because I do think that has been part of the great difficulties. When people say, when I raise the question of race, then naturally certain people want to say, but then you are the racist. But no, actually, when you raise the question of race, it's an acknowledgement of diversity. It's also an acknowledgement of our historical pains. Yeah. That says, but for, so sent, for, for decades, black South Africans had been left out. Therefore, yeah. Issues that pertain to black South Africans then become South African issues, which means yeah. black people and white people, colored people, Indian people must work together to address that injustice. No. And therefore, as a vehicle, yeah. you needed to be able to create a vehicle where South Africans who shared that vision yeah. needed to continue to work together. So there came a moment where I thought to myself, I'm not going to be invested 
in simply just pursuing that. Yeah. I've got to but, pursue but what was that moment? Was it after the elections or before? I think it was subsequent to the elections. Yeah. And ultimately, when you start to get some by-election results, where certain, and in fact, those by-election results were one set, it just became the internal climate yeah. where you could feel that there was almost a pursuit of saying, perhaps if our leadership looked this way or behaved in that way, yeah. then perhaps we could recruit some yeah. of those voters back. And whilst you yeah. want some of them back, but clearly you can't convince me that everybody who left, left on the basis of saying, no, 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 this party is no longer liberal yeah. or whatever. The Did the return of Helen Zilla precipitate your decision as well? I mean, uh, uh, there are a lot of people who argue that, you know, that, that should have been dealt with the matter. The Helen Zilla phenomenon should have been dealt with a lot more decisively than you did in your tenure. No, I, and I think to reduce the conversation simply around uh, Helen Zilla herself yeah. is to narrow the conversation. I, I think more than anything, this is not a question of black people versus white people. Yeah. It genuinely was about when she came back, I realized that the organization wanted to go in a particular direction. Yeah. And that wasn't... It represented, was, almost it represented the past, let's be frank. It represented the return of a leader you had replaced. Correct. No, but no leader can like that. So, so in essence, yeah. it would then become, and uh, it would then become a space upon which you would almost have the vision that she served for the organization, yeah. and perhaps the view that I'd taken about yeah. where I wanted the organization. Yeah. To. But don't you take some responsibility, right, in how you have dealt with her? You seem to have molly coddled her. Let's be, let's face it. Uh, you no, know, I, I, you I, would remember. I mean, I'm not a prophet, but in 2014. In one of the letters I wrote to you, I said to you, you've got to be careful of the people around you because they, they, it, it seems to me that they're going to rain on your parade. And this was after you had been elected mm -hmm. and Zilla defended uh, uh, what, there was a chap who passed away, may his soul rest in peace, who was at your Congress when you were elected, um, uh, uh, who, who said that Ferro Vurt was a fantastic guy, was actually a clever politician. All right. Uh, 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 I remember as a journalist. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and Alistair, Spark. Alistair Sparks, right? And I said to you, this for me is, is I'm nervous about it, right? But that was only one of at least 10 incidents around which if you are consistent as a DA in terms of a federal legal commission, etc., etc., Zilla should have been retired long ago. She has embarrassed you by saying all sorts of racist things, let's just face it, colonialism tweets. Now there's even a recent one now. Uh, they, they don't know where to, 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 to stop. Do you take some small responsibility in the manner in which, not just Helen Zille, but some like Kola Barnard and others, who kept giving a, a, a sense of unease about the direction that you were pursuing as leader in terms of one South Africa for all? Yeah, often you, any leader will face opposition. You have to be willing to live with that. But when you face opposition, that doesn't also mean that you need to act in, in ways that go beyond what is your scope as a leader. So, for example, in the initial tweets, I was very clear. I opposed them. We took action. In fact, for the tenure that I was at the DA in leadership, uh, it was very clear that I said to that the Premier must continue running the government and that she shouldn't serve in any of the structures of the DA. Mm. So when she returned, it then changed that arrangement. It was became untenable. Yeah. And so for me, I think that you need to always act within the constitution. Otherwise, leaders who act outside their own rules then yeah. suddenly operate as dictators within this province. And yeah. I certainly am a Democrat, uphold those views. And when we worked within that space, and I think much will be written about uh, that time in the yeah. DA, and I certainly will be writing about it. Yeah. I think that the project of a non-racial South Africa is hard. Look. Yeah. I'll but Mashaba was, was, was less uh, apologetic about this. He was very clear. She said, if Selen Zilla returns, I'm out of here. Yeah. Right? And he was out. In two days, he was gone. Mm -hmm. right? You followed in another two days. After the break, I want to know what, you know, what, what, what was the thinking there? What, were, you, were you pushed? Do you feel pushed right, at, at that point? Because the, my question is, if Mashaba didn't resign on the Monday, would you have still have resigned on the Wednesday? Or you would have felt, I must stay and fight? So that's the first thing I want to deal with mm. after the break. Mm. Then quickly, let's go into what are the big lessons you are taking with into your new political future? Two or three big lessons mm -hmm. out of that uh, particular uh, experience of leading the DA. Musi Maimani, former DA leader, joins me tonight in a fireside chat about reflections on the past and the future.
Stay tuned. I'm gravely concerned that the DA I signed up to is no longer the DA that has emerged out of this weekend's federal council. The DA no longer represents the party that is able to achieve what I desire most, a movement that can save South Africa and seat the ANC and deliver one South Africa for all. Without this, I'm deeply concerned for the future of South African politics. The DA has taken a resolution at this weekend's Federal Council meeting to question the role of the party in governance relationship I find myself in and the way in which we communicate on that relationship. This follows the expression of views by a number of DA public representatives that these arrangements are undermining the DA's message and contributors to its electoral decline. I regard this to be the worst kind of short-sighted thinking, even by the very low bar set in recent times. This position includes no perspectives of the residents of Johannesburg and what they want for the city. This has simply been ignored. I maintain that coalitions are the future of South African politics. For a political party to back away from such arrangements 18 months before a local government election that will invariably produce more coalitions is tantamount to declaring itself to be unsuitable for the future of this country. The election of Helen Zeller as chairperson of federal, uh, federal council represents a victory for people in the DA who stand diametrically opposed to my beliefs and value system. And I believe those of, of, of most of South Africans of all backgrounds. I cannot reconcile myself with a group of people who believe that race is relevant in the discussion of inequality and poverty in South Africa in 2019. I cannot reconcile myself with people who do not see that South Africa is more unequal today than it was in 1994. I cannot reconcile myself with people who fail to realize that we have a patriotic duty to unseat the ANC and save our country before it is too late. <clears throat> All right, our, our frank talk with Musima Mani continues tonight, and uh, we are reflecting on the past and also on the future shortly. Yeah. Just before we get into now uh, the future, um, tell me the sequence of events there. Mashaba, the, when Mashaba resigned, right, uh, I was puzzled that you were at that press conference, right, and, and, and you, in fact, ended up saying, this is my hero, and, and he had just lambasted the DA, as you have seen there. You are still the leader at that time. I, I, I think that even in my poor analysis, I thought, no, he's, he's going now. My, my man is clearly going. Had you already made a decision by then? Yeah. Or, or not? I, I think one of the other untold chapters yeah. that uh, perhaps need to unfold, you will remember equally so, I had over the previous weeks before that endured public smear campaign mm. that was personal, false, and to be quite frank, vitriolic. Mm. And I could not dismiss the fact that it was established by certain people who were within the organization itself. Mm. And therefore, progressively towards that, I'd known that to stay would be, in fact, to endure some of the things that yeah. had been progressing. So with or without Mashaba's decision, yeah. I needed to, I was heading in that direction and made yeah. a decision to say, look, it is untenable to work with particular citizens who simply cannot, in fact, argue a legitimate case but want to attack you at your personal level. Yeah. So, that was the start in many ways. But secondly, I was becoming all the more alert to the fact. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you another story. Yeah. Uh, one of the days I'm in parliament, there's a gender-based violence march. I happened to bump into the president of the republic. I said, Mr. President, there's a problem here. You can see the citizens are angry. Xenophobic violence is on the rise. We must act and we must be able to provide leadership in society. And I was startled when I walked away from that conversation. I thought to myself, you know, if this country catches fire, who and which leaders are going to be able to engage citizens in a proper way? Mm. 
And frankly, it's an indicator of the fact that there's a progressive distancing between institutional politics yeah. and citizens. Mm. They are sitting at home, they are disengaged from politics. They feel like politicians are sitting in parliament discussing things that are only relevant to them. Mm. Our people are hungry, they are poor, they are facing up to criminals, and it would feel that they don't even know who their public representatives are. Mm. And I was becoming all too concerned about that because I felt horrid. we don't have activism in this country. We've lost that sense of, you know, this is our country. These are our public representatives. Yeah. We must hold them to account. And therefore, it became a point to me where I had to say to myself, we needed an activist-based movement. And you will recall, you can ask anybody, I raised even this question inside the DSA. Without an activist base, a genuine conviction about yeah. the fact that I want to hold people to account, yeah. I want to mobilize it's the interesting streets. interesting you are raising that because I want you to tell me frankly whether, despite what you are saying now, right, that there was a part of you that wanted to stay and fight to a point where, in fact, right, you may not have immediately thought that it was a right time for, for a Mashaba to resign, for example, because you could have foreseen, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that should Mashaba go, the DA will lose Joe back, right? We, and now the promise you have made to people there and the progress he has been able to make there mm. will all be flushed down the drain, which, uh, it, you know, one could say that that, that that came to pass. So it didn't automatically mean that the DA will then keep, keep Joe back, uh, you know, even if Mashaba goes. Was there a part of you that wanted to stay and fight? And why was that not an option? Or, right, am I right in believing that Mashaba then, you know, in a sense destroyed that option by leaving? Because then, th with what he said there, to stay was becoming even more untenable. No, I, th I, think, I think the decisions are not linked. I think I, I, what is important to realize is that as the progress was heading towards that, as I outlined earlier on, do not dare forget the fact that when I talk about this activism and I talk about the option to stay and fight, I'd been fighting. This had been a continuous battle for a long period of time, at a yeah. personal level, defending my own integrity, at a public level saying, these coalitions that we need in Johannesburg, in Tuan, I'd, I'd been fighting for those things. It wasn't that this was a unanimous decision up front. Yeah. It was always that... I believe that actually the future of this country required coalitions, and it's been one of the things that I believe still about the future of this country. Yeah. One party dominance dis delivers state capture. Actually, we need coalitions in this country where different yeah. parties can work together. So there'd been an always a constant battle. There does come a point where you say to yourself, is after this battle the vehicle still the best vehicle to deliver this one South Africa for all that I keep yeah. fighting for? And therefore, that's why I've had to sit back and say, I've got to get back to activism. I've got to build a movement on the ground. Because ultimately, like I even argue... And that could, not be, that could not have been done in the DA by strengthening the constituency that clearly uh, was, 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 in a sense, germinated around your presence. Remember, let's not uh, mess around, right? There was a discussion, and I've, I've, I've established this with a range of your DA leaders. At some point, there was a discussion that says, for the DA to go beyond the plateau of, in terms of growth, you, you, you cannot sustain having a wide leader. Let's just be mm. blunt about mm. it. That you needed to appeal to a broader constituency where the broader majority sits in order for you to be a government of the future, right? Are you then saying, right, that you were unable to consolidate enough strength and sway within the DA block that was progressive to use that platform, because already the, 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 you know, the organization structures were there, structures are establishing the ground, this infrastructure, mm -hmm. you've moved to Joburg, you have a head office. In a sense, you have gone way down the line mm -hmm. uh, you know, to allow a fringe right, on the side of the DA to actually reverse all those gains, and now you are back to having to start from the beginning when you've left all of that work there in the DA. You no, I, I think, JJ, mm. what's also important to note is well, I've gone down that track. Mm. One of the saddest days for me was because Joburg and Tuane and all these governments fell. Yeah. I was overseas, had taken some time out. And when I got that call, it broke my heart. Because despite my own views about the DA, yeah. I still think undoing change in Johannesburg mm. is not helpful for citizens. Mm. 
I'd consolidated people within the DA. I think the direction was clear. We'd set ourselves up. But it also became important that when you lead in a political formation, people were no longer fringe, some of these people who wanted to actually get this organization back. Yeah. It became quite clear that on race alone, Helen Zilla and I held very different issues. Yeah. And now suddenly here she was actually heading up the actual institutional framework. Yeah. It became quite clear that there were certain people who were wanting to advance a policy platform that might undo the idea of what redress must look like. Mm. It became very clear that there were some who were saying, as you know, the report that was even adopted at the Federal Council before, said that these arrangements of government where coalitions were working are no longer the places that yeah. we should be in, which at my core are some of the things I genuinely believed in, yeah. in redress, in being able to achieve yeah. ad addressing historical do injustices. You think, do you think, so once yeah. that nucleus got into the center of the organization, yeah. it was no longer fringe. Yeah. It then became such a point that yeah. I could say to myself. But, but maybe it was a culmination of a, of a symptom that you yourself was not able to reverse in, in, in the fact that race, the way race was dealt with was always a, a, you know, a mixed messages platform, honestly. If I talk to you, and I always said this to you, if I talk to Bongani Waloi, mm -hmm. talk to Mashaba, and I ask you the same question on BE, I get three different versions of what the DA is about. Do you think that uh, in, in reflection, you yourself were almost restrained in how you, you, you dealt with the issues of race? For example, you were elected, uh, you know, uh, clearly because you're, you're competent in the context of the, your colleagues, etc., etc. But there was also an issue of saying we need a black leader, right? But as soon as you elected, you then said, yeah, people mustn't use race as a mobilizing factor. And, and, and your black caucus was irritated by that. Because no. Because well, they didn't understand I, what you meant. Hey, JJ, let's not mix various stories here. Let's not. I believe in redress. Mm. I've always maintained the fact that the injustice that was committed was done by, was done on black South Africans. Mm. Therefore, if you want to build a South Africa for all, yeah. all South Africans must work towards ad addressing yeah. that issue. And you're consistent with but that. But it does become a problem when you have internal electoral processes in the DA. Yeah. And then you end up saying black people must only vote for a black person. Sure. White people must only vote for a white yeah. person. Because when you do that, then you are creating internal mobilization. Yeah. That then you then in South Africa the body politic yeah, must then remain the same. Yeah. Then but, you must but say this hey, mobilization thing you're talking about, you talked about it after you elected. No, I said not it before. even before. Because I've always been consistent. I would even stand against any political party in South Africa yeah. that would stand up today and say, black people must vote here. White people yeah. must vote there because then we must stop democracy. We must, we must rather look at the yeah. census results and say, oh, Makhoikana, how many white people, how many black people, and that's how we must allocate yeah. votes. We should not do that. Yeah. We must have the confidence to say at heart, as a South African yeah. who is proud to be black, the people who must join the activist movement, the yeah. people who must vote for Musi Maimai, must be a diversity of South Africans. Okay. Then indeed, okay. we are I moving got, towards I got to, freedom. They're shouting at me now, I've got to take a break. When we come back, people's dialogue, right? Or whatever future you are crafting for yourself. What are the lessons? Two or three lessons that you are taking with you into the future. Because a lot of people who are in the DA may just join you or may not, depending on what they, how they understand your departure, right? And I want you to reflect on that when we come back. We're going to take uh, some break now. When we come back, of course, uh, come and ready with some headlines, and then we go back to the conversation with Musi Maimani. You can also start calling us um, uh, on 010-594-5140 here on Newsroom Africa. Let's take a break now.
fireside chat continues with uh, Musi Maiman. In the future, actually, I want the fire, actually, actually have a fire around here so that people <laughs> feel warm, you know. Uh, always good talking to Musi Maiman. We'll be talking some more after the headlines about the future now. What is he going to do? What lessons is he taking with uh, to the future? But let's hear what's happening elsewhere in the world. Come and ready. Over to you. Thank you, JJ. Grieving family desperate for nothing but the truth. In our Kampianzi's parents resort to desperate measures after being denied access to the Nyati Bush Lodge in the northwest to visit the site of where their 13-year-old son drowned during a school orientation camp. An aviation expert is warning of the long-term effects of the grounding of SAA aircraft. The cash-strapped national airline is trying to cut costs as it waits for a 2 billion rand bailout from government. More woes for a municipality already marred by poor service delivery. The South African National Civic Organization in Emalathleni is calling for municipal officials to be investigated for alleged corruption and nepotism. Movement for Democratic Change leader Nelson Chamisa calls for Zimbabweans to continue the fight for the country they dream of. This as a crippling economic crisis there deepens. Headlines. It's time now for JJ, of course, to continue his fireside discussion with Musi Maimani. JJ, it's back to you. All right, thank you very much, Carmen, uh, for those headlines there. Sad situation out at, at SAM, and I don't know what we're going to do with all these parastatals, and I've, I'd like to hear some of your views towards the end of the conversation sure. about what kind of leadership we need and what are the interventions. There seems to be a lot of despair there in the sectors, whether it be ESCOM or SAA or, you know, PRASA or Transnet. It's all, uh, it seems, the wheel seems to be coming off every day. Right, lessons. Yeah. What are the big lessons that you're going to take with into the future and can you describe what, how that future looks like? Yeah, uh, first of all, I, I, I think for me, the big issue is always to be very clear and articulate your vision. Leaders live on that. And you need to remind yourself always that people forget that. Sometimes they look at election results, they look at by-elections and forget vision. Mm. And I've always held a vision to say that men and women in South Africa, black and white, can live together harmoniously, peacefully and safely, and can take back the activism in their country. We must always never forget that. And I think for me, that's been one of the most important lessons. The second one is always that we should always be clear that an injustice is committed. And one of the things that at times, rather than challenging certain people, you know, in South Africa, we have two cultures. We have a culture of fear or a culture of, or the contrary culture is a culture of hope or a yep. sense. When people are operating in fear, they believe all resources are scarce. So there's a natural challenge towards saying, I'm going to stick to my own people, I'm going to look after. And I want to say even to people who are wealthy, people who have resource, people who have opportunity, you, are, you have the duty and the responsibility to make sure that there's much bigger inclusivity. Yeah. And I think that has been one of the things that as I take away, to also confront head on. Yeah. Because leadership isn't just a question of the leader. It is a broad cohort of people yeah. who must be able to challenge that. And I thought at times there were opportunities where I needed to challenge people to say, hey, when are you been, to whom much is given, much is expected. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, and so I think that's been one of the key things that I take going into the future. And ultimately, when we talk about our why as a country, we've got to return back to those values that yeah. says, hey, hey, we must be a shared South Africa, we must be an inclusive South Africa and that the vision for non-racialism is something that I will continue to fight for. Yeah. And, and, and you don't think that 
uh, formulation, uh, you know, given your cooperation with other opposition parties through the years that you have been DA leader, mm. could be found in another political vehicle where you could simply throw your lot in there and build not from scratch, but from a base, right? Uh, you know, that, that could, you know, take us rapidly into, take you rapidly into uh, maybe governance, even if it's at local level and so on. What, how does your future look like? Uh, well, that's, a, that's the next important thing because ultimately the system in this country, uh, I always describe it by saying you get a political party, you get big funders, they join big unions, that whole system works, they give some grants to people, yeah. they become loyal to the party first, they go to parliament, they vote for things we never know anything about. Mm. We are losing touch. So another political party in the plethora of the many that are there is simply to distance ourselves from there. So one of the things that I really want to return back to, I've already spoken about this idea of activism, but I also want to speak about this campaign for electoral reform. The sooner we can change how we vote for people, the better it is, because then we can suddenly say, hey, I'm voting for JJ from this community. He yeah. will go to parliament, represent me, and I will hold him to account. Yeah. And when we do that, yeah. then it's not just a question of the so that's, 49 that's parties.